Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? With, well, some of you will remember how the old rhyme goes on. And that uh, has perhaps a particular relevance for us at home. Um, some who uh, will know that my uh, wife retired as a teacher just over 12 months ago. Her retirement coincided with her 60th birthday. And one of the major plans, the projects for her retirement, was to take in hand our garden. In fairness, it had been neglected. Sadly, perhaps embarrassingly neglected over the pre te previous 10 years while she was working full time. And as that combined with her birthday, one of the things that our daughter brought her for her 60th birthday was a packet of mixed, mostly wild flower seeds. Those were put into pots in the spring, they were planted out and put in various places in the transformed garden. And during this year, during this period of uh, when we've been at home enjoying some wonderful weather, alongside the things that were known, beetroot, tomatoes, lupins and lavender, there was a, grew, a mix of plants, things out of that mixed packet of seeds most of which, to be honest, well, certainly when I was looking at them, was the question of what's that? What's growing there? At some time, at times, some of them looked as though they were auditioning for a, a book or a film. Some of you may remember John Wyndham's book, The Day of the Triffids. Others were beautiful. Some gave off an array, amazing aroma, an amazing scent. But each one was an unexpected surprise because we didn't know what the seed was from which they were growing. God's garden is different. God's garden of salvation isn't like that. God plants a seed and that fruit and the fruit of the seed is expected to reflect the nature of the seed itself. It is that seed that moves people like you and me, who says in verse 14, from death to life. We know that we have passed from death to life. And that he is echoing something that Jesus had said while he was here on earth in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Let's see if we can find that. John 5 verse 24 says this. Um, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I suppose at the beginning of our time together, it's worth asking the question, is that where you are? Have you passed from death to life? Remember when we were together last week, um, we looked, or we weren't together, but uh, watching last week, we looked at the end of John's Gospel where he says that we, the things are there for us to believe that by believing we have life in his name. So are you at that point of having moved from death? to life. That's the key element, that's what John wants us to know, wants us to be sure of as we look at this passage together. And what he's saying is well, one of the ways we know is how that seed is growing in our life. The seed, it's the seed of Christ's sacrifice, the seed of Christ's death for us, the seed of, life, of Christ's love which works its way out in his sacrificial death for us. It's something that uh, Christians celebrate when we gather and when we can around the table of uh, sometimes called the communion table or the uh, Eucharist in different churches. It's a time when we remember that Christ died for us. And that is a sacrifice of him who gave up his life so that we might know life, life for all eternity. It's a gift. In Romans 6 verse 23, Paul says that the wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And sometimes that's spoken of as a great exchange, that on the one hand, God in Christ gives us life. And in return to achieve that, he had to take our death for us on the cross. And it's a gift that comes out of God's love undeserved, unmerited, freely given love. 
at the beginning of the chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, how great is the far love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And if that seed is love, what should the plant be that grows from that seed? What should the fruit be that grows on that plant? That's one of the great themes of this letter. And we see it in verse 14, we see it again in verse 23. This is his command, to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us. And in that he's echoing when Jesus talks about the, the seed and the, 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 the good seed that produces good fruit. And the challenge that if we are truly God's people, then what should grow in our lives, what should be evidenced in our lives, that fruit that should come out of that um, working of God in our hearts should be a reflection of God's love and God's care for us. So he looks at that in this passage. He starts off by looking at a, an outcome. Then he reminds us that love can only be seen when it's seen in action. And he looks at a second outcome. And then he sees a culmination of that life, that love, that living in the last few verses. The first outcome, well, I wonder whether you like good news or bad news. And if you're going to have a bit of both, which would you prefer to have first? So shall I tell you the good news or the bad news? Well, it does depend doesn't it, how far you, in this chapter you go back as to where you're starting with good news or bad news. Verse one, we've already read it, but let's read it again. How great is the love the, the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That's not bad news, is it? That's wonderful news, that's amazing news, that God should make us his children. Children that in one place, Paul talks about being equal heirs, co-heirs, with Christ of God's kingdom. People have a relationship with God which allows us to call him our Abba, our Father, to run up to him, to come to him and to be welcomed as his children, precious, loved in his sight. But in the particular part of the chapter that we've been reading, we see an unexpected outcome to love. It's a response to an outcome that John thinks might surprise his original readers and indeed it might surprise us. It is that when we show love to one another, those around us, neighbours, colleagues at work, even family members are likely or possibly going to hate us. I should read that. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. So let's go back a bit. Um, it's in verse 13, isn't it? Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. I wonder, does that surprise you? It certainly didn't surprise John. It didn't surprise him for two key reasons. He's writing this letter at the end of his life. He's writing this after many years of so seeing what would happen to the early Christian church. And there are two things that gave him reason not to be surprised. The first was what Jesus himself had said while he was here on earth, just at the very end of his life, as, a, as he was about to go to the cross. In John chapter 15, in verses 18 and 19, it said this, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. But also not only what he'd heard, but what he'd experienced. Think of the early days of the Christian church. Think particularly what happened to his brother, James. How James was killed. Peter thrown into prison. How Stephen was killed. How others were taken away and the whole church was scattered because of the persecution that came in the very early days of the church. And as you go through the history of the church of that first century, we could almost use there was an old um, 
rhyme or way of remembering the wives of Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded and died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. And if you swap divorced for imprisoned and perhaps beheaded for uh, crucified, you could find that that was true of so many of the early Christians, the early disciples. They were imprisoned. They were crucified. They were put to death. Some died. And some, like John, survived, but after long years of imprisonment, his exile on the island of Patmos. And that has been and still is the experience of God's people throughout the last 2000 years. 2020 saw the death of a man called Minkaya. I can't pronounce that rightly, right, it's spelled M I N C A Y E, I think. It's a reminder of something that happened over 50 years ago when a group of loving, caring Christian men, best known a man by the name of Jim Elliott and a pilot, Nate Saint, went to try and tell a group of uh, people in the Ecuadorian forests of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were brutally murdered. And Minkaya was one of the men who took part in that massacre, that murder of those six men. But then the families of those who had been killed went to share the love of Christ. Among them, the son of the pilot Nate Saint. And Micaiah, Micaiah became a Christian. And he adopted the son of the man who he killed as his own son. And he has recently died. The change, the transformation from a man who hated God's people to one who became one of God's people in love. You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Christians are a challenge and should always be a challenge to those who are around because we live, if we're following Christ, in a way that's different from those around us. Do you remember in the days, well, some of you will remember the days when we had proper blackboards in school. And sometimes if a teacher wanted to attract the attention of the class, he would run his fingers along the blackboard and just if you can remember the sound the feeling and christians in some ways not in a negative way but a positive way should be so at living in a different way that it draws people attention to the gospel but in a way which challenges and causes a sensation in their lives and that's been true for the last 2000 years. Christians have found themselves persecuted, threatened. Just think of just two examples. One, a man we came to know in Burma, who read the Bible and came to meet with the Lord Jesus Christ and his family threw him out. He wasn't allowed, he couldn't see any one of them for five years because he left the family's religion to become part of God's family in Christ. And in the city of Southampton now, there are a number of people who had to leave their homes, who had to flee because they have become part of God's family in Jesus Christ. They've come to know the love of God, but in doing so, they found themselves thrown out in th under threat of possible death, and certainly of other things because of that new relationship they have with God. That's the people that you know about, people that you're aware of, people who've come to know what it is to be hated by the world because they've come to know and to experience the love of God. Let's uh, stop for a moment. Perhaps you'd like to spend some time thinking about people that you know, people in your hearts, people that the support, church supports, and pray for them. Come back to this passage in just a little while.